Welcome to The Change Lead, the podcast providing leaders with the insight needed to get things done in a rapidly changing and complex world. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Connect with our community of like-minded leaders on our website, thechangelead.com. Welcome to The Change Lead with your host, Babatope Ipiyumi. An M&A event is typically accompanied with organizational redesign, digital transformation, business carve-outs, and operating model changes. This amount of change can overwhelm many business leaders. Today's guest helps leaders take their teams and organizations through change with confidence, calmness, and candor. Jen Campbell is a certified coach and facilitator. Jen is a sought after thinking partner and a problem solver with decades of experience in change and a background facilitating M&A integration. Today, Jen and I will have a conversation on transformations, mergers, and acquisitions. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really looking forward to today's conversation on transformation, mergers, and acquisitions. Excellent. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, likewise, I'm looking forward to today. Um, I think to start, it would be good for our audience to know a little bit more about you, actually. So you've got decades of experience in change, but also, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit unusual, you also have a background in mergers and acquisitions. So given today's topic, I think you're just perfectly suited for the, for the, for the conversation. But it would be good to understand a little bit about that background. Can you share a little bit about your background in change as well as your background in mergers and acquisitions? Of course, of course. So I started my career, as you say, decades ago in, uh, <laughs> in management consulting. So I worked for a global firm um, and we had what we called back then a change enablement practice. We didn't even call it change management. We called it change enablement. Um, and I worked, so one of the clients I worked on uh, early on in my time there was this large merger and I was I worked on that client probably for a year um, I also had the opportunity to teach change management or change enablement as we called it down at the global training center to new consultants um, and so since then I've worked on several different organizations with several different organizations in-house um, and as a consultant to lead change among other things um, whether that was to improve process or implement new technology um, or develop people to prepare for promotions um, and as I say, you know, if you're a leader in today's organizations, you lead change. So specifically then the time and projects I've done with mergers and acquisitions. So I've worked with organizations who have merged and need to align usually, right? They're people, their processes and their systems. So I actually have a story in my book, which I think we're going to talk about later. Talking change must have conversations for successful leaders. So there's a story in there about two travel operators that merge. And so that that's the merger I talked about earlier that worked on for a year. And there were, of course, lots of systems and lots of processes, activities that needed to be done to get those two companies aligned. Um, But really, the people needed the most support to move through that transition and to get to know each other, because now these two organizations had to work together. They were put into the same building. These used to be two separate buildings. And so and they had very different cultures because one was a family owned business and one was very corporate. Um, So they really needed to become a team especially in the operations department that I did a lot of work with. And, you know, one of the best ways to become a high performing team is to actually spend some time together. So in this, in this sort of seemingly insignificant small move, what we did is we eventually just put them all together on the same floor because they were on two different floors, um, put them all together. It was an open concept office. So they had to sit across from each other and look at each other. And eventually that forced them to talk to each other and they got to know each other and they started helping each other through the change that was happening because A lot of the systems and processes were just an upgrade for one of the companies, but they were brand new for the other one. Uh, So it also made a huge difference because they could see what each other was doing. There was no like speculating the worst about people if you were sitting on a different floor or in a different building or in a different country, right? So they really got to know each other and help each other. And they really did eventually become a high performing team. So that was one great um, M&A experience. Uh, Another one, I also worked on a sale of a company. So for this one we did, and, and that wasn't why I was originally in this organization, but in my time there, that's what happened. All of a sudden this company was up for sale. Um, 
And so we spent a lot of time to prepare the people for the process of the sale. And this was a big manufacturing plant, um, you know, to make sure they were performing at their best because, you know, we were, so we improved processes, we improved their skills prior to being sold. So they had some confidence that they could add value to the new company and keep their jobs. Cause that was a big worry for them going through an acquisition process. So I'd say those are two sort of significant ones that stand out for me in, in my career. Yeah, those are brilliant stories, actually. And they, they reflect how challenging when you're merging and acquiring companies it is. Um, something that you've, you've got a lot of data on from your stories, which I've figured out more anecdotally. So about mm-hmm. six months ago, I spent a bit of time just reflecting on the initiatives I've been on, which ones have proven to be the most challenging. Mm-hmm. And I actually came to the conclusion that any transformation done in the context of an m a in context of a merger an acquisition a, uh, a joint venture those have proven to be the most challenging from my experience as well because it's almost like you're adding an extra dimension to the change you're trying to effect um so it's, it's brilliant that you've got those those stories just mm-hmm. to confirm confirm that that thinking that I've, I've actually come to the conclusion as well that yeah i agree with you 100 percent because you bring in you know, it's, then you get two, it's bringing two different groups together, right? So you've got two different cultures, two different systems, processes, two different ways of doing things, and then trying to bring everybody together and get along and, you know, succeed. So, yeah, cool. Now, it's, it's a good background. So you already mentioned your book. So we'll yeah. dive in. So I've got a copy of your book here, Talking Change. I see you got the, got it in your background as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've got Talking Change. So in the book, you you talk about different types of conversations. So first of all, I'll say I really like the book. The way you, it's it's going to be how can I be? You it's a book that you have to re- refer to many times. So mm-hmm. it's structured in a way that okay, there's a lot of content, you've got it covered, and it's one that you can refer to many times. So first of all, well done on putting that together. Thanks. Now, <laughs> in in the book, you talk about different types of conversations. You say there must have conversations for successful leaders. Um, One of those are self-reflection conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're good to get started there. So for these self-reflection conversations, can you describe what are these conversations and particularly how do do they apply in the context of a merge and acquisition for M&A? Leaders going through that challenge, how do they use self-reflection conversations? For sure. Um, yes, and, and I agree with you on the book. At refer- I, I think I say at the beginning, read it, read it in a weekend, reference for a lifetime. And it's, I go back to mine a lot. It's dog ear going, okay, I need to have this conversation now. And you're right. The book is set up as a series of conversations. And, you know, if you're a leader in today's organizations, as I said, you lead change. That's what you do. Um, so I'll give a bit of context about the book. So there's three sections. Um, my general belief is that, you know, change doesn't happen without a conversation. So the theme of the book is all of these conversations needed to lead change that sticks. So part one really sets it up to dives into that people side of change, right? What are typical reactions to change? Why do people resist? Um, I provide a roadmap that we might talk about later um, to lead people through change as well. In the second part, I talk about, well, why conversations? Why are conversations needed? Who needs to be in those conversations? And how do you facilitate those conversations? And then in the third part, I get into the three sets of conversations. Um, So self-reflection conversations, as you just mentioned, uh, planning and managing conversations, then engagement conversations. So there's 20 in total, um, and you can follow along. You can facilitate all of them if you'd like, um, but really how best to use it is to pick and choose based on the situation you're in. Um, You know, so I provide the purpose for each one, a list of questions you can use to facilitate and what would be next steps out of that. So as you say, the self-reflection, like this is a place, this is a great place to start. So, you know, when you're, when you're a leader during change, you need to sort of think about, well, what's my approach to change? What have I done in the past? What's my sort of bent towards change? You know, and in the M&A context, you have so much uncertainty and so much pressure to perform at your best um, so that you're accepted by this new company if you're the one being acquired um, so that you can build trust with the new player. So even if you're the acquiring company, one of the first things you're going to need to do as a leader is build trust among uh, yourself with those teams and then among those teams as well. So taking that first step to consider what's my own approach towards change? Where might I have roadblocks or resistance? So one of the first conversations in the, in the, 
self-reflection conversations is that personal change journey conversation. So this helps you recognize patterns you have um, in where you've experienced change or how you've approached change in the past. Helps you uncover where you might resist. So for example, you may be a leader in your current company, but under the new merged company, perhaps you're not gonna have the same role or even the same status. And so, you know, going through this self-reflection conversation can help you uncover um, what you might lose. Because oftentimes when we feel we're gonna lose something during change, that's when we dig our heels in and resist. So knowing this about yourself helps, helps you figure out a way past it. And if you're the one leading others, and you're resisting, you can bet that your team is going to follow your lead, right? They're going to resist as well. So getting, getting that out and having that conversation with yourself um, is a great way to start to sort of get past any resistance that you may have. Uh, and then the other, there's three conversations in that one, but the other one I'll mention is the prepare yourself to lead change conversation. So this is also a great one to consider when you need to know or do or learn to be an effective leader during change. So this conversation leverages, leverages that ABC transition roadmap that I mentioned, which considers all of the steps you need to go through um, in transition to, to lead through change effectively. And it helps you sort of walk through and think about what do I need to know? What do I need to learn? What do I need to do in these different steps um, to make sure that I'm an effective leader through change? So I take myself through this transition of change and then I can take my people through it as well. Okay, so I think these are these are key conversations that leaders need to have, particularly within m and um, It would be good to understand maybe dig into a little bit more into these self-reflection conversations, actually. How do you actually have these conversations with yourself? Is it something you can talk to? Is it you talking to yourself or how does it happen? Yeah, literally, you can talk to yourself, whether that's, you know, just on a sheet of paper. It's really, it's kind of like journaling, right? So um, in the book, like all the conversations, there's a set of questions. Um, so you can go through and write out your notes um, for the questions. And then I give a little bit of guidance. So in the, in the, um, in the first one, in the personal change journey one, you actually fill out two columns and go, okay, what's a change that was that I chose and what's a change that was imposed on me? And I go through this set of questions. And then I tell you to look for patterns. Where do you see patterns in changes that you've been through in the past? So am I someone who um, jumps on change right away and go, oh yeah, like I, I was all over mm -hmm. that and I was okay with doing it right away. Or are you something you're like, oh, it really took me a long time to accept that something was going to be different. And I really, I waited till the last moment um, to actually make change. And then there's a question in there too on what's sort of that turning point that actually helped you, you decide you're like, all right, I'm in, I'm in with this change. And sort of when did that happen? And what is that for you? Because can you then, can you replicate that um, in a future change and go, okay, I know I need to get myself to this point or this turning point and I'll be on board. So can you make that happen faster for yourself through future changes? So it is yeah, literally that's, that's, have the conversation with yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, and I think I like the way you put some structure to it. Cause I know some people mm -hmm. will be hesitant. So how do you have a conversation with yourself? That structure, that template is a good guide. Yeah. Um, and it just shows the importance of having that conversation with yourself. Um, yeah. I think there's this saying, I forget who, who said it now, that knowing others is wisdom, knowing yourself is enlightenment. That it there actually <laughs> is actually quite key to understand yourself. Um, that is actually even more important than mm -hmm. figuring out other people. So no, thanks for that. Um, so you've already mentioned the three types of conversations. So this is the self-reflection yeah. conversation that we've got that in the bank. We might come back to it, but I think we've got that mm -hmm. um, in the bank. Now, the other one, the, the planning and management type of conversations that you have in the book. So for, th for this one, um, just put it, I mean, my, my lens on it, and of course, you, you can't come with your lens, my lens on it. When I think of private equity firms who are typically heavy, they, they are the m and masters, really. Yep. They tend to have this sometimes five, sometimes three-year portfolio planning cycle. Um, so they say they're going to raise tens of millions of pounds or dollars over a period of time. And they've got a plan for five years and they're buying, merging, disposing assets over that period of time to, a, to an objective. It speaks to a lot of planning and management by default. So it'd be good mm -hmm. to get your take on what are people doing right and wrong in this space for, and for leaders, what conversations do they need to have to ensure that they're doing the right things when it comes to planning and management? So, what's a big question? Big question there, Pepto. Okay. Um, so, 
you know, and I say the planning and managing conversations in the book are, they're really good for your, for, especially for the teams that are going to implement whatever your change is. So if you have a project management team, you have people on a change team, you have folks who are working on whatever your initiative is that is going to cause the change. Um, and so you want those folks involved, which isn't necessarily the leaders, the ones who cooked up this idea, whether it's for MA or something else, right? Um, however, in the leader sense, um, the good conversations for them is, is the starting with the why conversation. Why are we even doing this? So why are we amassing this money? Why are we creating these plans? Why do we want to buy this company? Whatever it is. Um, and so you need to create that compelling case for change. Like this is the first step in getting others interested and motivated about your change. So that why conversation is why are we changing and why now? So, you know, in the MA space, it's why are we buying this company and why now? If you're on the receiving end, it's the, why do we want to sell and why now? Like what is causing us to want to do this, whether it's something in our marketplace, um, something internal, whatever it is, right? And so digging into those types of questions will help you build your case for making that change or making that sale or purchase um, and identifying why it's going to be good for the organization and for your people and also why it might not be great for everyone in some cases. So it gets you to sort of thinking about, especially as the leader, right? You get these, we get these big ideas as leaders and we think it's going to be great for everybody. It's not necessarily going to be great for everybody. So starting to think about why are we doing this and why now? Um, because if you don't have a good reason to change, you're going to be hard pressed to get people on board. And that's one of your biggest things that you need, right? You need people committed to this change and moving and rowing in that same direction to actually make it, to get the benefits of the change or the benefits of the sale or purchase of this company. So that would be one of the first ones I'd say is why, you know, what needs to happen? You need to have that why conversation. And so, so in the book, there's, there's nine conversations in the planning and managing section. Um, and, and, you know, I think as the leader of this change that you're trying to make or this purchase, it's the M&A agreement, um, you need to have that why conversation. And then the other one I would put up there too, as the leader of it is the situation conversation, um, be another good place to start. So the situation conversation is really a chance to figure out who do you have on board with your ideas already? What's the lay of the land? What's happening now within your organization or within the organization that you are hoping to purchase um, to figure out what might be stumbling blocks or roadblocks? What's it's almost like doing a bit of a SWOT if you were doing it on the um, the organization you're going to, to buy. Um, and then on your own side, it's a bit of doing the like, are we ready for this? Um, if we're the organization purchasing, are we ready to take this on? What's our situation? Who do we have on board from our side um, to make this change or to, yeah, to make this change happen and purchase this other company? Um, so it gives you that chance to sort of get that lay of the land and going in with your eyes wide open. I find this gets missed a lot. And we don't sort of do a readiness and a magnitude of what this change might entail. And then we get surprised um, why people don't like it as we move down the path. So yeah, I say those would be two two places to start. Yeah, I think, I think it's, no. Thanks for sharing that. It's quite interesting. The, the two you've picked are probably the two that I see missed the most when it comes to totally. planning and management. First of all, the why the why question. Sometimes people, what I see, and good to get your take on this. People attempt to answer the why, but the why is still a what in abstraction. Yes. Um, yeah. not quite a why. So that, that, that is key. That is so key. And it's, it's, it's something that has come up so much in a lot of conversations I'm having with people who are really thinking through the change management process is we need to start with why. Why are we doing this? Um, to and be why successful. now, right? I think that's key. Sorry to interrupt. The why, like why, why we think it's a great idea, but why do we have to do it now? Is now the right time? Is a year from now the right time? Like whatever, right? So yeah, yeah. why now? Yeah. And I think the, the scenario, the scenarios, the conversation is also, um, I, I, is that's around the environment you're in, the context in which you're trying to deliver something or get anything done, in many cases is actually a bigger factor than anything else. It's, it's almost like you've got a fish in water. Well, it's the water around you that's going to determine, it's not how fast you can swim, it's everything around you that's going to determine your success. So those are, I think you just hit the nail on the head of the two key ones that, that are quite important when it comes to m a in particular. Not just m a but given mm -hmm. the, the complexity yeah. and the challenges with m a th those are key. Um, so I think we covered- I love your, the, sorry, let me just say, I love your fish in water example. I think that's a great one. And it comes to mind because my 
my daughter just did a science project on what would happen if I put my goldfish into the ocean, goldfish being a freshwater fish into a saltwater ocean. And she did this whole project on osmosis and things like that. And yeah, you don't survive, right? And so what is that environment that you are going into? And you know, what's the current situation? So then you can figure out what do I need to do with it differently to make it a conducive environment for success, right? Or in the goldfish's case, to live. Yeah, no, I think I'll, I'll take that. That's a brilliant analogy. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll, I'll note it down. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. So we've covered two of the types of conversations that are critical so far. Yeah. So the, the, the third one you mentioned in the book are engagement conversations. So I think from this is around winning over the hearts and minds of people, really. So I think, are there examples you can share of where you, you've used these conversations or which, com- which of the conversations would you, because I know mm. there are 20 in the book, which ones would you recommend that are specific, relevant to m a as well? So examples on which ones would you recommend for leaders here? For sure. And, and these engagement conversations, and there are, I believe, eight of them in the book. Um, the, this is where the, I say the rubber hits the road. So these are the conversations you take to the plant floor, to that field office, to all of your employees before, during and after your M&A process. You know, for change to stick, people, um, you know, and for you to get the re- results and the benefits of that change, you need your people on board. So you know, they're those are the people who work in your business every day. They're the ones who make your business happen, right? And you need them to be committed. So people feel committed when they feel heard and they feel heard when they're engaged in these meaningful conversations. Um, you know, and I love the engagement conversations and each one is useful for a different situation. So one of the places I say to start is what I call the debrief conversation. It is the first one in this set. Um, and this is where you find out what people have actually heard. So in the case of a sale or an acquisition, for example, there's always rumors flying around, right? People love to speculate about what's going to happen. And those rumors are not usually positive. Everyone's going to lose their jobs or, you know, the new company is going to come in and change all of this, whatever those rumors are. So if you gather your, your employees together and you may do it in, in specific groups um, and have this debrief conversation, and this will give you insight into what they've actually heard based on those announcements, because we know what gets said and what people hear can often be two different things. So finding out what are those facts that people have actually heard, finding out what the rumors are that are out there, because then you can do something about those rumors and address them. I say, if you, do, if you don't know, you can't address them, right? So, um, and then having that conversation and figuring out what have people actually heard, that's gonna help you determine like, what's your next step? Um, what else do you need to be talking about? And I always say, you know, you never know what people are going to latch on to when you announce something in an organization, right? You announce a change or something like that. And um, I had a great example recently where they were um, part of the project team that I was working with. They were in a meeting with the CEO of the organization and, you know, talking about here's what we're going to do and it's going to do these great things and this and that and the other. And the CEO asked a question and somebody answered like with a throwaway number, right? Oh, it's going to, you know, do this by 10 per increase this by 10 percent and um and it was not even a confirmed number like it was just sort of a throwaway question we've done all this big presentation and everything well the ceo that's what he took away from the meeting is this 10 percent number and he wasn't happy with it and so that was it took a long time for the project team to get him past that um, because that wasn't even the point of the whole presentation right but people latch on to different things they latch on to what they want to hear um, or they latch onto the negative, whatever it is. And so really uncovering what are those things that people have actually heard is your starting point to then figure out where to go to next. And you may need to then have some individual conversations to, to debunk some of those rumors that are flying around. So that's a really good one. Um, another one I'd say, and this is another one that doesn't happen enough, and it's very similar to the situation conversation, is what I call the change track record conversation. So you know, in many places I've worked, especially when it merged companies, you get, there's people that have worked in these organizations for 25, 30 years, and they have seen this movie before. They've seen the flavor of the month come and go. They've perhaps even been through other mergers or acquisitions. And so this conversation really minds the reactions to the past change. So, you know, and I do it oftentimes as like a big timeline on the wall you know, what were the changes that have happened in your tenure in this organization? What worked? What didn't work? You know, what faith do you have in the current leaders 
um, to actually make this next change happen. So people get to see their peers and their colleagues' perspectives on past changes. And, you know, if their perspectives were different than theirs, my sister and I did this like, timeline just with our family and like how we observed different events in their own family kind of thing and our different reactions. And it was really eye-opening to see, oh, you thought that was a great thing that happened? I thought it was horrible, like totally ruined my life, you know, stuff like that. And so you see that in organizations as well. People have different experiences with the same change. Um, but it's also, so it's a really great team building exercise to sort of get that on the table. Um, and it also gives you that chance to then pick and choose things to take forward. You know what, here's something that worked really well in a past change. Let's make sure we do that again, whether it was like a set of training that was done or a set of communication or just how something was created and who was involved. You can take those things forward, those best practices and use them in your future changes for hopefully better and faster success. Oh, brilliant. These are wonderful conversations. Um, just a question on these, and it's probably going to apply to beyond just the last conversations you mentioned. Yeah. How do you facilitate these conversations? Because I, I, I'm thinking of leaders at the top who have the, who've got the authority, but they will not be skilled for some of these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, you, how do you, how do leaders get skilled in having these conversations in a sensible, productive way? It's a good question. And it's, you know, skill is one piece. And then sometimes if that leader is in the room, people don't like to talk either, right? They get a little bit um, afraid to, to say their real feelings or real reactions. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing on the facilitation side, so I do as much as possible as you can learn from a book. I do put out like, here's some things to think about. Here's the cornerstone, what I call my conversation cornerstones um, of what to be thinking about and how to be present in these conversations. Then I also talk about just some good conversation tips, right? And facilitation tips. So how to engage the group and making sure go to that, like, you know, especially the engagement conversations. I do these on the plant floor. I don't bring, bring those plant floor fo folks into the boardroom. That's totally intimidating for them. So I give some ideas and tips around that kind of thing as to how to sort of set yourself up for success for the facilitating. Um, but also sometimes you can leverage whether it's internal or external leverage someone who's great at facilitation within your organization um, and again because if it's you know sometimes if you have the leader and that leader's team there people aren't as open so if you want that more openness depending on that team you might not have the leader in that situation in that conversation you bring in a third party again whether it might be somebody internal who can do it um, or somebody external like myself who would come in or yourself who could go in and have those conversations Okay, no, that's good. So there, there are guides in the book of how to have these yes. conversations productively. There mm -hmm. are also people you can you can leverage internally, and sometimes the context internal is good, and sometimes a third party coming in neutral with a bit more experience of seeing this in different mm -hmm. contexts, seeing knowing what good looks like when it comes to a, a sensible, productive conversation can can help. Or sometimes a combination of both. Which I think I've yeah. seen I've seen that exactly. work as well where you bring somebody external, working with people internal together, mm -hmm. you can actually create something quite good. So no, yeah. that, that's quite good. So it's, I think for our audience, I think that's a very good foundation of the three key um, conversation types in your, in, your, in that you ref reflected in the book there. Um, you've already touched on it briefly at the start. I want to get into it. The transition roadmap. So I think mm -hmm. it's called the ABC transition roadmap. Um, I see it's got a TM mark on it as well <laughs> in the book. So I'd I'll, I'll like to get into a little bit of that. So can you just tell us a li little bit about, about that, the, the roadmap, as I've just called it roadmap for now, you yeah. tell us exactly what it is, how you got, how you got to it. Um, for sure, for sure. So, uh, I mean, I've used in my years, I'm sure you've seen in your years too, like lots of different models. And, um, and so based on my experience, I crafted this one that I call the ABC Transition Roadmap to help you lead change. Um, so I'll just go through quickly. So A stands for awareness. So in any change, I first have to know that it's actually happening, right? So I need to be aware of what's going on, which is generally the first step in most change models out there. Um, B is for buy-in and belief. So I need to buy into the why of the change, which is why the why conversation is so important that you've actually had it and those leaders can, can convey that to you as to why we're changing. Um, but to buy in, you know, I may need to see evidence or proof of this change. 
Um, so, and I may not be fully, buy-in doesn't mean in my instance here anyways, it doesn't mean you're fully committed yet, but I buy into the idea. I'm like, okay, I get it. I understand the compelling reason for this. I can buy into that. And then the other B there is belief. And so belief is so important. Um, and if I, so if I don't believe the change is possible, then there's no way I'm going to commit. And I'm right, right? This change is not possible. I'm not buying in. I'm not committing. So, you know, for example, if I, if I don't believe that I can run a marathon, then I'm right. I'm never going to be able to run a marathon. But if I, I believe that I can actually finish a marathon, then I'm going to be motivated to put in the work to do that, to train, to eat properly, to mentally prepare, and then to be able to cross that finish line. So I believe that it's possible. I have a better chance of actually making it happen. So then we get into the C's and there's two sets of C's. So the first one is capability and capacity. So capability is, do I have the skills, right? Do I have the skills and knowledge to actually do something different? So, um, you know, we're putting in a new system. Do I actually know how to use the new system? Or we've got a new sales methodology. Do I know how it works? And do I know how to make it, make it work for me and build more sales? Um, so this is where your training, your coaching and stuff comes in. And most companies do that, right? Training is always sort of on the change list. The capacity piece is what I see often overlooked. And so we tend to just pile on changes to everybody. And, you know, you just sort of do it off the side of your desk. And so uh, people don't have the time or the capacity to actually work in a new way or do something different. So there's another conversation called the stop, start, continue conversation. Uh, that's a great one that can help you address that. So building that capacity to actually make change in your organization. The second set of C's is for commitment and continuation. So lots of models, change models out there, they stop at the commitment stage. Okay, I got everybody on board. Check. My change is a success. However, um, you know, what we really need is for people to continue, continue making decisions in alignment with the direction we're going to go, continue working in a new way. So this is where you need to reinforce your change, not give people leeway to revert back to their old way of doing things, because that's often what happens. I do this great exercise when I teach various change um, trainings is I do this exercise within the seven dynamics, using the seven dynamics of change. And inevitably, everybody revert, reverts back to their old way at the end of this exercise that works every time because there's no co compelling reason. I have no incentive to stay changed. And so you really need people to have that incentive to stay changed and to continue in that new way to realize all those benefits that you said in your why. Why are we doing this? It's going to be so great for this, that and the other. Well, to get those benefits, you need people to continue and not go back to their old ways. So that's the model. Um, and the um, planning and managing conversations, as well as those engagement conversations, they line up against that model um, so that you can move people from awareness all the way to continuation. Um, and ultimately, there's a D in there, your desired destination. So ABC transition roadmap in a nutshell. Okay, nice. So A is for awareness, B, yep. belief, buying. Yes. And I've got in the different order, which That's you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, <laughs> you got capacity and keep um capacity, capability. Is it cap That's right. And, yeah, and then commitment and continuation all the way going to D. You got it. Right? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Now so that, that's really good. So that's the ABC transition roadmap, like you that's said, right. in, in a nutshell. How can we then apply that to these merger and acquisition challenges that we that we see around the world? Um, what's your yeah, and this is where you know I have a course for leading change for project managers that I take all those planning and managing conversations and I line them up against the roadmap to help them. So when you're developing a change, so taking a merger and acquisition, when you're helping this organize, these two organizations um, move through this, you know, what's the first step, right? I need to make people aware. Okay, now I need to help them believe and buy into this. So I need that why, I need to talk about the reasons that are going to, you know, why we're doing this, why we're doing this now. Um, I need to give them the capability. So you can sort of work your way through that model um, and use the conversations in the book that line up to that. So, you know, for capability, you can go and have what I call the performance conversation. Um, so that really figures out, okay, in this new world of these two companies together, um, what roles are still going to exist? 
What's the expectations that we have of people? Um, where's the skill gap? Like all of those conversations, all those questions. And you can have that conversation to then figure out how you're going to build the capability under this new world that you're going to have. So you can use all of the different conversations lined up to this roadmap to really help you through, through step one, step two, step three, step four and go, how do I build my plan from the people side of change to actually get people on board, committed and doing this in the new way? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I like that. Clearly, there's a path to apply the ABC transition roadmap very neatly to lots of challenges, but mergers and acquisitions yeah. is just, just another one which can apply. We can apply that too. So this is, yeah. that's really good. Um, I think, Probably in closing, I think we've covered a lot of MA transitions um, so far. But in closing, it'd be good to know a little bit more about what you're doing, um, what projects you're working on right now, and also how people can reach out, how people can contact you as well. It'd be good for you to share a little bit more. And any final thoughts as well you think you you, you want to you want to touch on in terms of trans transformations, merging acquisitions as well. Oh. I'll give you one more conversation that I often get asked about um, in the engagement conversation list before we, before we close off, which is the, are you on board conversation? So I get asked this a lot as to what do I do? I've got this person who just keeps resisting and they just won't buy into this change. They just won't commit. So this is the, are you on board conversation, which many of us have either wanted to have or have had in our careers with others. Um, and it really gives you a process to gather the feedback and then engage in that conversation with the person to determine a path forward. So in many cases, you can't just fire them. Um, but I think what you'll find is by engaging in this productive conversation, you'll be able to move that person forward, even if you thought all hope was lost. So that's a really good one. It's been sort of the one-off conversation that I've even sent to people to say, you know, here, try this conversation out of all of them. If you've got this one sticky person on your team and, uh, and they've had some great success with that. So I'll leave that, that conversation with you. And then in terms of me, thanks for asking. So, um, I am doing a couple of fun things these days. And if you can always find me at actionimpactmovement.com. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn, Jennifer Campbell. I'm sure there's many Jennifer Campbell's on there. So I'm based in Whistler, BC. Um, so you might be able to find me that way. My profile tagline right now is I help leaders build buy-in for their big ideas and make change happen. So that's where I bring in sort of my coaching role and my experience in leading and implementing change role and sort of merge those two things together to help leaders lead change. Um, you know, I spent many years as a coach to leaders with new teams or new mandates to really help them craft their ideas, engage their people to buy, get input and buy-in, um, and to implement their plans. So uh, we have a lot of fun doing this. I really enjoy this kind of work. I find, you know, often these leaders, they need a sounding board and that thinking and execution partner. And so I bring my consulting experience, my change experience and my coaching experience um, in that combination of skills and abilities and, and to really help them have that impact that they're looking for and sort of organize their thoughts and have a plan to make it happen. So that's one thing. So I do some coaching for that. Um, and then I've also got, um, I did mention my leading change for project managers course. So that's an online on-demand course um, that project managers can take. I teach it live every now and then as well. Uh, and then I also have a training program that fills really what I think is this missing link. So one of the things I think is missing in the land of change management is um, something geared towards people managers. So all of the people in your organization who actually lead and manage the people, the, the people who do your work every day, they are not necessarily equipped to to help make change happen in your organization. And they're often like this change is often imposed on them, right? And so they have to work themselves through the transition of what's gonna be different for them. And they also have to lead a team through transition. So I have my aim changer course um, that uh, helps them do this. So first they need to lead themselves through change. So we go through those aspects, help them understand what are the people sides of change, you know, resistance, dealing with resistance, roadblocks, understanding um, all of that kind of stuff. And then I help them create a plan. So we go through the different conversations. We talk about the situations that they're in and figure out which conversations they can take away and use right away in their own personal situations um, so they can lead their change, um, their people through change successfully. So that's sort of that missing link, those middle management um, people managers in your organizations to help them take their people through the change so we can all realize the great benefits of change that we're trying to realize. Yeah, I think I, I like that. I think I, what you mentioned there at the end, those people managers, that is actually quite key. 
Um, yeah. And this is this is anyone who's been around change for a while, you begin to see that it's a you need a mindset shift with the people leaders to get anything yeah. done. Um, and it's question is how do you engage? How do you engage there? How do you effectively come alongside those professionals, those leaders, coach them? and make them the leaders of change. So instead of imposing exactly. change, which is the default behavior, you almost need mm-hmm. them to become yeah. the partners. So you coach them and, and, and bring them along and they become the advocates for the change mm-hmm. themselves. So it, it's quite key. That's, that sounds like yeah. a very, very, very useful course, really. So thanks, thanks yeah, for that. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I'll do is that your details, I'll put some contact details, so like your LinkedIn um, details on the, the show notes as well. So the description section so if you're listening to this on spotify apple Podcasts, google podcasts it will be there in the description i'll put a link so it's easy to to get to you so you go to the right jennifer campbell yeah (laughs) (laughs) also if it's youtube just go to the description section you you see you see that there as well um jennifer this has been a brilliant content packed conversation yeah Uh, lots of content (laughs) i know i was like oh given a lot of information in a short period of time but (laughs) Yeah, but, but it, it, it reflects your work, it reflects your book, it reflects um, a, a, a lot of content that you, you put out there, reflect, reflect, reflects mm-hmm. you. So, so that, is, that, that, that shows that it's, it's, it's good value. So thanks so much for your time. Um, yeah, no we might have to bring you back at some point because I think this is, <laughs> we, we need a part two of this. Um, but thanks, thanks, Jen. Thanks for your time so much. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, that's a wrap. Would you like to learn more about leading through an M&A event? Would you like to join in the conversation about transformation, mergers, and acquisitions? Connect with the community of like-minded leaders on our website, thechangelead.com. When you visit our site, click join to join the community. Check out the show notes for details on how you can contact today's guest, Jen. Also, please don't forget to like, comment, review, and subscribe. Thank you very much for tuning in. Have a great week and see you next time.